So in the last part, we uh, talked through what historical materialism is uh, and, and kind of developed a bit of like a, a worldview, an ideology, kind of a, a framework to, from which to approach uh, capital, volumes one through three, which I think is important. Um, and now, and, and the, the main reason I think that it's important is because what I would like to do, I think the only way to properly read capital, whether you want to agree with it or not, is to kind of play the same game that Marx is playing and see it and, and, and kind of understand what it is that Marx is trying to do with the book. Um, and so, we, you know, economics, right, as we know, is kind of a, 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 a form of intellectual labor in which we reflect on the mode of production is how I kind of defined it. Um, but now we understand that class plays a part in this because your entire perception of the world and your entire like consciousness is, 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 is connected to class. And so where you are within the mode of production is going to influence what you take away from it. In other words, we, we can understand now that economic theory is never neutral. Whoever does the economic thinking is going to have, it, have their perception of the mode of production distorted by their class. And, and so this is why different classes have their own internal ideologies. I mean, the ruling, class is, the ruling class does intellectual labor among itself and comes to conclusions which are expressions of their class interests. Um, if you are an academic and you live a nice, comfortable life in academia, then your views are not likely to be very radical. They're not likely to, you know, the conclusions that you come to about the world, about what, you, what should change about the mode of production, aren't probably going to be anything that would, I don't know, endanger your position because you're comfortable. And so th that's, I think, a really important thing to understand is that, is that um, you know, economic theory can't be neutral because economic theories come to conclusions. They come to decisions about what should be done. And as long as an economic theory is meant to come to conclusions about what should be done, those conclusions are always uh, going to boil down to we should devolve power to this particular class. They just always do. You know, they'll say this and that, they'll, they'll point at various math, they'll point at numbers and so forth. Um, but at the end of the day, the conclusion is this group should have more power and this group should have less power. You can say it in a variety of ways. You can develop a whole vocabulary for expressing your class interests. But at the end of the day, your economic take is going to be, unless you're very aware of it, uh, an expression of your own class interests. Um, now, this dynamic um, tends to put the lower classes at actually a severe disadvantage, and that's for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that who is doing the intellectual labor? It's usually the case that the manual labor is done by the lower classes and the intellectual labor is done by the upper classes, or at least the middle classes. And if that's the case, then, then there aren't a lot of, of, of lower class people coming up with, you know, doing economics, if any, right? And so there's, there, you know, the, the lower class economic theory is going to tend to go a little underdeveloped. That's reason number one. Reason number two is that the lower classes don't have political power. And if the upper classes have the political power, they, they control what, what Althusser would call the, the ideological state apparatus. They control the ability to impose their ideology down on the rest of the population. You know, the, who, owns the meat, who owns the television stations? Who owns the newspapers? Who owns the who owns the like dialogue, right? Who has the control over that stuff is going to have a unique ability to project their class interests and suppress everyone else's. And so, those two for those two reasons, you tend to. Uh, this is one of the reasons that that a lot of the time the, the proletariat accidentally expresses somebody else's class interests, or maybe even you know, most of the time expresses somebody else's class interests. A lot of the time, you know, people mistake middle class uh, expressions, you know, petty bourgeois expressions of their class interests, stuff like, you know, modern monetary theory and stuff, they mistake that as their own class interest because it does sound good. It's significantly better for them than, than you know, the neo, the, the, you know, the neoliberal uh, uh, line of thinking. You know, they only, they only think that because they don't sufficiently have their own theory developed and, and they don't, or they don't have a, a, a way to receive it. And so now we can kind of get to an idea of what Marx is really trying to do in Capital Volumes 1 through 3 and all of Marx's work in general. What Marx is trying to do is he's trying to theoretically arm the proletariat. He's trying to give them a vocabulary by which they can express their class interests. And that vocabulary it should include an economic analysis of capitalism, which comes to conclusions that involve basically saying the proletariat should seize power. 
And so that's the game that Marx is playing, and I think it's important to recognize that before you start to form your own understanding of the of the works, because you need to understand that that's the game Marx is playing, regardless of whether you uh, 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 want to come to the same conclusions as him. If you're going to propose any solutions to Marx and say this is what Marx really wanted to do, or something like that, you had better be playing the same game as him. You had better be trying to come to make sure at every point that your economics, that your suggestions on how to fix the problems with capital, and there are problems with capital, um, volumes one through three, uh, there, there are issues. Um, your, your proposed solutions to those issues had better not defang the, the book. You better kind of be trying to make sure that you're coming to conclusions that benefit the proletariat, that, arm, that give the proletariat a justification for a seizure of power, essentially, you know. Um, now, uh, to some people, this might kind of be alarming in terms of its, its implications about the nature of truth, which I'm not really going to get into. Um, but I, but I think it is it does beg the question at this point: if economic theories are just expressions of the class interests of people, and everybody thinks that they're thinking objectively, and everybody's trying to actually get to the truth, but they're just end up ending up expressing the class interest, then who's right? You know, who's correct? Um, and so here's my take on this. Um, my take on this is basically that if you are anybody in the world, any, anybody participating in the mode of production, um, regardless of where you're doing it from, and you make, a, you make an observation in good faith, that observation is going to be valid for you. It's going to be locally valid given what you, what's around you. That's, num that's, that's important thing number one. Uh, it'll be distorted by where you are in it, and, and it'll be as distorted as anybody else's views. Um, so the amount of distortion is the same, uh, and it's also kind of a local observation, usually. Um, and with those two things in mind, let's kind of lay out what we have here. We have a situation where in a, we, we have class society, and in class society you have these discrete kind of, of, of classes, and each class has their own view of the world. Their own, uh, their own theory, which approximates the world. And let's assume that they're all equally developed, right? Let's assume there's been enough people thinking, there's been the same amount of people thinking the same amount about each one. Um, so we have these, these, these kind of multiple theories about the world. Each one approximates the world. Each one kind of has the same amount of distortion associated with it based on the class. So which one is correct? I think there's an objective answer here. Uh, the objective answer is that, of course, the one, that's, the one that is most correct, the one that approximates the world the best, is the one that represents the interests of the biggest class, right? The, one, the biggest slice of the population. And maybe it made more sense to go the other way. I can tell you which one is the least accurate, and that's going to be the theory which expresses the interests of the, of like 1% of the population, right? Take the billionaire class. Their kind of economic theory that, that they love right now is neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is ridiculous. The, the ideas it has are ridiculous most of the time. They're just insane. They're flimsy as hell. The, the, the kind of uh, philo philosophical foundations are, are, just, are just, you know, nonsense. Uh, a lot, I mean, okay, I'm giving my opinions here, but you, but you see what I mean. I think that the, there's going to be the most distortion in the economic theory that represents the smallest class and the least distortion in the theory that represents the biggest class, just by kind of virtue of sheer democracy. In other words, I think that in any given class society, um, the most accurate theory is the one that represents the biggest class, the, like population-wise, the biggest. Um, that's true for capitalism and any other class, in any other system. Uh, that's my own take, and that's why I value uh, Marxism above the other ones. I've made that decision sort of as an academic, that um, I think that the that you know. I think that is the that is the economic framework that I want to go with for, and that's the reason for it. But in any case, um, I think now we're finally ready to really get into the actual <laughs> argument of the three volumes of capital. So uh, let's do that. So the immediate question we are confronted with is, where do you even start? You know, uh, <clears throat> uh, and Marx had a lot of trouble figuring out where to start. Um, but I think that it's actually probably clear to to us today. That, that the appropriate place to start is these two concepts right here, commodities and money. Why is that? Because they are the most distinguishing features of capitalism and also the most kind of mystifying and alien. A lot of people seem to think that commodities exist in every mode of production, and they kind of do, but they don't, they aren't, like, most things aren't typically viewed as commodities. In capitalism, everything is a commodity, as we know, uh, including ideas and information, everything, right? Uh, 
but we have this vast system of, of kind of hieroglyphics that kind of are associated implicitly with every single object around you. Think about how weird that is. Anything you look at around you right now has a number attached to it. And that number, it, it, you know, you call it price and you know how to work with it. But, you know, I think that, you know, a good place to start, at least, <clears throat> in an analysis of capitalism, is a discussion of what are these hieroglyphics? What do they mean? What are they actually, how do they get there and what are they? You know, it's, it's hard to, like, distance yourself appropriately from the world that you're in to, to respect how insane it is. But, but, you know, I think Ian Wright has an interesting quote here that makes it very clear how, how kind of crazy it is that you can just look around and see that literally everything around you, including your ideas, uh, has, has, a, has a number associated with it that allows you to equate anything to anything else. Only dedicated occultists would dare claim that everything we see around us, all the things and activities in the world are, despite all appearances, really the same. That one kilogram of caviar is the same as 1,000 different people clicking on the same internet advertisement. Or that clowning at a children's par uh, party is actually the same as 200 rounds of shotgun ammunition. Or that one month of computing time is, is, uh, on a high-spec machine is, is in the cloud is the same as one ton of potatoes. Only highly trained adepts could begin to see the truth of such counterintuitive and magical affinities. This is Ian Wright, by the way. I'm not sure if I said that. Um, but, but, we see, but we more than see the truth of it. We openly and regularly achieve it. We manifest these magical affinities on a daily basis. We treat quantities of fish eggs, human attention, clowning performances, bullets, computing time, potatoes, and a bewildering array of, of, array of other things as the same. Because in the marketplace, they are all may be exchanged for one another via the alien mediator we call money. That, that term alien mediator is, is, is a term that actually Marx uses in somewhere. And... Um, there's there's another dimension of this that makes it even weirder that that Ian, Ian right here is getting at, which is, you know, I can look at something and see that it has a price, uh, you know, and I understand that that has to be some kind of social agreement. Humanity had to agree to make that the number that's associated with it. It's changing, but at any moment, you know, it's it's humanity's decision to trade things the way that we trade them, and yet the prices present themselves to us as if that's not the case. The prices of things kind of confront us, right? I, I, I can like, no matter what I put into making something, once I've made it, it has a price. And that price kind of confronts me as something alien, something that, that is, is, is the opposite of something that it seems like we all agreed on. Um, you know, people treat the market like it's some kind of God. People talk about the, the market behaving as if it's doing things independently of people, that it's steering us rather than us steering it. And so, we're going to keep talking about this, but this is kind of what Marx called commodity fetishism, where um, where we've kind of imbued the commodity itself with some kind of agency that is, has been alienated away from ourselves and made to seem objective. And and it's a very uh, we'll, we'll keep talking about this as much as we can as we go. Um, but yeah. But in any case, we know our starting point now. If we're going to make sense of capitalism, we should probably start by trying to understand these numbers that are attached to everything. So what we need is a theory of value. What is value and where does it come from? Uh, you know, what, that, that's kind of implicitly the same, sort of the same question is what is money? Like what are these prices actually a reflection of? And so you're told something about this in high school, of course. Uh, you're, you know, you're told the story that it basically is a, is a function of supply and demand. Uh, you know, we have various ways of measuring how many of something there are and how uh, much people want the thing. And that the, that the price of the thing is a basically some kind of compromise between those two things. If the demand is high, but the supply is low, the price will be high. If the supply is high, but the price is low, but the, but the demand is low, then, then the prices will be low. Um, and, that, and you're basically told that that's the end of it to some extent. Um, but there's immediately a problem with this. Uh, and the problem with this is that what if supply and demand are the same? What, is the value just zero at that point? Or is the value some like one maybe or something? What do I decide it is? And let me ask you this, right? Consider a plane versus a pencil. Um, if, the, if the supply and demand are the same for a plane and supply and demand are the same for a pencil, what, uh, you, well, shouldn't the plane be more, sh still have a higher price than the pencil? So there's a, there's a hole there. There's something missing in that, in that conception of what price is. Another thing to ask about uh, a theory of price in which everything is left to supply and demand uh, that I kind of want to leave somewhat to, to your own decision is, is to ask the question, as you should always ask with any economic question, who benefits? Who benefits from a theory of price that is like this? Um, who's empowered and who's disempowered? And I would argue 
that uh, a theory like this, which reduces all everything down to supply and demand in terms of price, uh, is very much in the interests of, of the capitalist class at the expense of the workers' class, at least in terms of empowerment. It, you, you, I, I also would, would say that this tends to alienate both parties. This tends to actually uh, uh, aid in the fetishism of, of, of price. But in any case, I do think that it disempowers labor more than, than it does uh, uh, capital. You know, if this is the case, then, then the people who control the circulation of things uh, are the ones that have control over what the prices of things are. In other words, if the worker uh, who, who, works, who works in production produces a thing, it's not going to do anything about the price. The production of things has no effect on price in a theory like this. Um, and you, know, you might argue that, well, okay, supply is certainly dictated by the capitalist, so that in, in some sense empowers the capitalist to have a say in prices. Um, but, but don't workers also have a say in terms of demand? Uh, there's a lot, I think, and this is, I think, one of the one of the great misconceptions of our current historical moment is the idea that consumers can, in some sense, influence the world through their their choice of, of consumption. And uh, this is a big misconception, in my opinion. It can it can be somewhat valid for non-essential goods like video games and media, but in terms of uh, the essential things, the things that that society tells you are essential, this couldn't be further from the truth. You do not, you, you know. It, put it, let me put it to you this way. Um, as many people as they want can decide to not use, uh, not, not drive a car, but that's not going to affect the fact that we live in a society that usually requires everybody to buy cars. You can find a way around it, but that's not going to affect the car industry very much because, the, because our cities were specifically designed to require people to get cars, right? It's the same thing with a phone. You know, I can't. You know, I can choose uh, to abstain from getting a modern smartphone. I can get some other kind of phone, uh, but that's not really going to change the the, the societal norm of have having a phone. The the capitalist class, the producing class, or the, the, the class that 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 uh, decides on production, that commands production, um, has I would say about ninety percent of the say in what in, in creating demand. Uh, the, the the capitalist class definitely, for the most part, creates demand. And the consumer class has only a marginal say in demand through their consumption. I think that's a very important thing to kind of uh, understand about our, our current society is that you're not going to change it very much through your consumption habits. Um, and so if you, if you accept that, then I think you have to accept that supply and demand as a theory of price uh, disempowers labor uh, and, if anything, empowers um, capital. So moving on. What we need then is we want a theory of price that does the opposite. We want a theory of price that empowers labor and does not disempower labor. And so obviously what, we, what that means is that we want a theory of price uh, where the labor putting go, that goes into something uh, is, is going to have a say in the price. And you know this is true already. Um, let me ask you this. Here's a, here's a scenario for you. And this I think that this happened to me as a kid, and you probably have your own version of it. Suppo like, so suppose you're in a grocery store uh, with your mom, uh, you know, you're, you're like seven or eight years old or something, and you're looking around at all these hieroglyphics on, the, on, the, on all the stuff all around you. You're looking at the t tomatoes and things like that, and you're seeing all the numbers, and you notice something peculiar. You, you see a watermelon, and you see that it's, you know, it's it, you know, just a full melon, and it's like $2 maybe. And then you look to your right, and you see the area where you have a bunch of, of pre-chopped up things, right? And you see a chopped up watermelon. It's the same thing. Let's say the same amount for simplicity, but it's not $2, is it? The chopped up watermelon is like three or four dollars, isn't it? And so you'll ask yourself naturally, why is that? Why is the chopped up watermelon more expensive than the regular watermelon? And the answer will immediately come to you. Everybody, you know, the, 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 the answer, the question resolves itself as immediately as, as, as the asking of it. The answer is, of course, it's more because somebody went to, the, went to the trouble for you of cutting it up for you. They put extra labor into it. The chopped up watermelon costs more because it takes more labor to create. There was more labor put into the product than was put into just the watermelon on its own. They chopped it up, and that's why it's more expensive. So we already knew. Everybody already knows on some level that labor has a say in price, that, that, that the things that take more labor create a higher price than the things that, 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 create, that take less labor. Now, the more skeptical among you might be kind of uh, scoffing at this and being like, okay, sure, fine, whatever. Uh, you know, if, if things take more labor, then that's a resource and there's more resource, so it should be more expensive. But shouldn't this apply to all resources? Like, what about oil? Right? It, it took some amount of oil to make the watermelon, which sounds odd, but, you know, it, it's true. 
the watermelon had to be transported. You needed some kind of tractor and some kind of machinery to, to produce it, you know, by the modern standards and stuff. Oil went into that watermelon as a resource, and it should be the sa by the same logic, you know, uh, something that takes more oil should also increase the price. So why is labor special here? Um, well, one thing that you should immediately res uh, uh, notice is that the oil also requires labor. So you might say, okay, what about the oil? So you can kind of de uh, kind of um, uh, take this th this idea and just kind of like reduce everything down to labor if you want to, and that, that, that that's kind of what Marx is this famous quote by Marx is saying it saying here is that you know economy of time to this all economy ultimately reduces itself. You can take all the other raw materials and you can break them down in terms of labor too, and you can come up with like a total uh, resource requirement of the thing, which is entirely expressed in terms of labor, because I think you'll agree. Well, okay, maybe it's not the case that everything requires labor. Um, but, you know, you can do that. But then you might be scoffing again and saying, oh, well, you could just do that with oil, too. You could break everything down in terms of oil, which is a little bit more dubious of a claim because I don't think oil goes into everything that is done. Um, but nonetheless, I think it's also missing the point because what are we studying? Remember, what is the point of all this? We're, 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 trying, we're coming up with an economic theory. What is economic theory about? It's about studying the mode of production. It's about studying the human mode of organization. What are we doing each day? We're spending our time making things. Labor time is, is very closely related to what we're doing in a, in, a, in a significant and fundamental way that is different than other commodities. We should care about labor more than the other stuff. Even the extent to which the labor theory of value is replaceable by other theories of value involving other commodities, that's missing the point and, and alienating ourselves away from our own product. I think that to some extent, uh, at least in terms of like a scientific mathematical breakdown, you have to view labor as like no different from the other commodities. But we all know that that's not the case. Because, the, because what we're doing as humans is we are the ones spending our time making things. Think about it this way. You know, I'm in a pre, say I'm in like a, a, what Adam Smith would call like an early and rude state of society or something like that, where, you know, we're, everybody's got, you know, the same stuff. I tell you, I'm going to go out hunting for the day and you say, cool, I'm going to be weaving today. And then I go spend the day hunting and you spend the day weaving. And then we come back and we share that product with each other. How do we divvy up, divvy it up? We each give ourselves a day's worth of the pro worth of the product, right? We're going to do it that way. That's just what's going to happen. Uh, so in, in early societies, it makes no sense just by kind of what an economy is. Um, it makes no sense to assume anything other than labor is like the, the what, Matt, what Adam Smith would call the first price. In fact, let me just go to this quote. Here's a very f powerful quote by Adam Smith to this regard. Labor was the first price, the original purchase, money that was paid for all things. It was not by gold or by silver, but by labor that all wealth of the world was originally purchased. You can actually show this mathematically to some extent. Um, there's, there's a, there are models that show that, that you can use, dynamic models where you basically assume that everybody has access to the same means of production. Everybody can make whatever they want and as much of it as they want by standard methods, and then they can bring their stuff to, to market and then trade around with each other. You can show that in any model like that, you're actually going to get um, an approach towards the labor theory of value. You're going to get you're you're going to approach a state of society in which uh, uh, the the prices of things, however people are measuring price, whatever people are using, is kind of like a universal, like a money type thing. Uh, that they're always going to be that those prices are always going to end up approaching uh, 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 an amount of time. In other words, like one dollar in that society is going to end up equaling essentially like one hour or, two, or, or 30 minutes or something like that. In other words, money in like a naive labor theory of value, which is what I'm describing, I'm going to call this the naive labor theory of value, money is simply a unit of time. In other words, one dollar uh, represents like alpha hours of labor for some alpha. And so if, if the price of a commodity is five dollars, and then it takes a, it takes five alpha total hours to create the commodity. That's what that that's what the five dollar price tag. That's what the hieroglyphic tells you basically, is that it, it takes that many hours. The dollar corresponds to some number of hours, so that you could look at the number of dollars and immediately think about the number of hours that, that it took to make something. Uh, that there's a direct correspondence multiplicatively between those two things. I'm going to make that more clear on the next slide, and I'm going to come back to this when I talk about this last point. 
But um, what we're really saying is not so much time is money. Everybody knows time is money, and we talked about why time is money. The watermelon example tells us why time is money. If it takes time to do something, they're going to up the price, right? That time is money. However, what we're saying is something stronger. We're saying that money is time. And so what we're going to do now is I'm going to describe, I'm going to summarize what we're going to look at as like a first pass um, of the labor theory of value. It's what Marx does in volume one and two. Uh, he doesn't, he's, he's, he's doing like a basically a simplification for the sake of the argument. Um, and so what I'm going to call this is the naive labor theory of value. Um, later on, it's going to get a little more complicated, but it's not going to get, but it's not going to, the, 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 it's not going to deviate too much from this, that the arguments that we're going to make involving this don't apply anymore. So the naive labor theory of value says the following. It says that the equilibrium price of any commodity is proportional, and so it can be basically thought of as equal, to the amount of socially necessary labor time embodied in the commodity. So there's a lot going on there. First of all, we want to make it clear that we are not rejecting supply and demand as a, as a driver for price. What we're really saying is that when supply and demand are equal, that commodities are going to have prices which are proportional to the values. And then as supply and demand change, that price will orbit around uh, that equilibrium price. In other words, the natural prices, as Adam Smith or Ricardo or something would call it, is, is, is the labor time. And the, and the market price is, is a, uh, a deviation from the natural price as a result of supply and demand. Um, but when we say, and I'll talk about what social necessity means in a second, but, but embody does not simply mean the amount of labor that goes into making the thing from the raw materials. It actually is going to include the labor that goes into the raw materials. So let's say that I have, uh, a, a, you know, a just think about a bunch of Legos, right? Uh, just to make it really simple, right? I put, the I put the Legos together, it takes some amount of time, and I come up with a product. And, and, and that amount of time is the living labor that I put into it. You know, time I take to actually build the product from the component pieces, right? But those component pieces also took labor to, to be put in front of me. That's the dead labor. We're going to call that amount C. So in other words, there's, there's value associated with the raw materials. And by the way, I'm going to refer to value as labor time. When I refer to value, I'm, going to talk, I'm, I'm really talking about time from, from here on. Uh, value in the Marxist kind of uh, uh, terminology means labor time. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, I, I'll do another example of this in a second. I'll, in the next slide, I'll, I'll talk about, you know, a BLT sandwich. Uh, you know, I, I, I use this example because uh, the ingredients are right there in the name. You know, I, I, you know, if I'm going to make a BLT sandwich, let's say it takes 15 minutes to do it. If the piece, if, if I have the bread and the lettuce and the tomatoes and the, and the, uh, and the bacon, if those are all in front of me, it takes some amount of time to put them together. But there's also time that went into uh, the ingredients, and I want to include that in the in too. So that that's where labor time is is different than value. And so I have basically the time required to produce the materials. That's the dead labor, and we're generally going to call this amount C. And then we have the time required to use the materials to actually make the thing, the living labor, and we're going to call this L. And, we're, and, and I generally use the, the notation lambda to denote the value, the Greek letter lambda. And so we have basically that the price of a commodity can be, or the value of a commodity can be written in, with this equation, lambda equals C plus L. L is the time it took me to make the sandwich, and then C is the time it took me to get those materials, the time it took someone else to get those materials in front of me. And so the, the value is not just the labor time, it's the total labor time embodied in the product, including every step that it took to get in front of me. So uh, I'm going to measure value in hours, you know, in this presentation. I'm actually not always going to measure it in hours. There's, there, we'll do something different in a little bit. Um, uh, but the commodity also has a price. So we have values and we also have prices. And, and so we can actually kind of convert directly from lambda to P, right? We can say the same thing. We can say that that the price of a commodity is the price of the wages that I had to kind of pay somebody to make it for me, plus the, the price of the raw materials. So you can kind of write a similar thing down for price that you can for value, um, where C sub P is the cost of the raw materials in dollars and L sub P is the wages paid to workers. Yeah. So basically, the naive labor theory value to put it into math, into math is to say that um, uh, P equals A lambda or alpha lambda for some alpha. I think, I, I guess I use A now bit of a mistake but yeah in other words the price is some amount of hours right one uh you know whatever the value is a times that is the price there's some a that i can just multiply by to go from p to lambda and go back from lambda. and there's you know i can of course multiply by one over that to go from lambda to p so let's do an example to make this clear 
I know this looks like a lot, uh, but we're going to go over it carefully. So suppose it takes, on average, 15 minutes to assemble a BLT sandwich, given the sliced bread, the lettuce, and the tomatoes, and the bacon strips. So this is the living labor component. If it takes 15 minutes to make a sandwich, and I'm measuring it in hours, then the living labor component is 1 over 4, right? 1 fourth of an hour, 15 minutes. And so you can see at the end, right down here, just to skip a little bit, I have lambda s, the value of the sandwich, is equal to c plus l, where l is the 1 fourth that I wrote right here. Um, so let's say that one BLT takes on average uh, one twentieth of a head of lettuce. And these are just complete numbers. These are numbers I pulled out of my ass. I just made them up. Uh, one eighth of a pound of bacon, one fifth of a loaf of bread, and one third of a tomato. Um, so these are the amounts of each lot raw material, right? There's a unit associated with a head of lettuce, right? One head of lettuce is how I'm measuring lettuce, and I need a twentieth of that to make the sandwich, and so forth. So suppose we already have that the value of a head of lettuce is lambda L, and that's half an hour. Uh, and that might sound kind of weird, but like, I mean, just keep in mind that like one harvest, one single harvest of lettuce, which is kind of the, the when you make a, when you, when you make lettuce as like a farmer, you're making a lot of lettuce at once. And so one head of lettuce is actually a very, very small amount of the total crop. And so if you're kind of distributing the, the labor time to every single different head of lettuce, then it's going to be very small. So that's kind of why I think half an hour isn't really that off, you know? Uh, and the value of a pound of bacon is lambda b, and we're going to say that's an hour and a half. And that the value of a loaf of bread is lambda g, which is two-thirds of an hour. And that the value of a tomato is lambda t, which is a sixth of an hour. Again, these are just numbers I made up. But we have the value, let's just say we have these values already. Then the total value of the raw materials for the BLC sandwich, this is the c component, the dead labor, is going to be 1 20th lambda sub L. That's one because we need 1 20th of head of lettuce. And so you take that and you multiply it by this. You know, 1 8th, we need 1 8th of, of a pound of bacon. So that's the 1 8th here. So you multiply it by the value of bacon. Uh, 1 5th of a loaf of bread, multiply that by the value of, of, of the grain. I, I said lambda G. Um, and then 1 3rd of a tomato. So you multiply that by lambda T. And then you plug those things in. You plug in those lambdas that are already given. And you get 2 fifths of an hour. That's the value of the raw materials. And then finally, we can f calculate the, the value of the sandwich by saying that, that the value of the sandwich is C plus L, which is 2 fifths plus 1 fourth, which is 13 twentieths, which amounts to 6 0.65 hours. So that's the value of a sandwich. It's not 15 minutes, it's whatever this is in minutes. Uh, and, if one tw and if $1 is equivalent to 20 minutes, then we have a, th we, you, know, we, this is you know, this determines the value, but if we assume the naive labor theory of value, then we also get a theory of price out of this. Um, keep in mind, you can calculate values without any thinking about prices at all. Values kind of exist, and we'll talk about the extent that they actually exist later, but like, you don't need to know anything about price to calculate these values. But if we are assuming the naive labor theory of value, then this gives us a theory of price. We can say, okay, let's say if $1 is equivalent to 20 minutes, that is a third of an hour, uh, then one hour is worth $3. And so the sandwich would be worth uh, uh, three times this, right? Uh, 0.65 times three, so $1.95. So this would tell me that if supply and demand are in equilibrium, the naive theory, labor theory of value tells me that the sandwich is worth $1.95. So that's kind of the naive labor theory of value as a theory of price. Uh, we should really be careful to specify some nuances and some caveats though. Um, so firstly, uh, I, I, I kind of overlooked or, or kind of purposefully ignored uh, one little detail about this, which is that when I say it takes on average 15 minutes to assemble a BLT sandwich, what I'm really saying there is that by the standard methods of production that society employs, it is only necessary to spend 15 minutes to make the sandwich. So what I mean, what I mean by that is that like, if I, spend six, if I spend six hours making a BLT sandwich and it, it takes an average person an average of 15 minutes to put the thing together, then that doesn't change the value of the sandwich. Values are determined by the average labor required and not the actual labor done to make the thing. So, you know, I, I, can take a, I can take an absurdly long time to make something, but when I'm talking about values, I'm talking about like a societally determined thing. It, so, you know, the, the standard methods of production and the standard way that people go about making things uh, determines the values. It's not, it's not the actual moment that you make the thing. To put it a little differently, let, let's kind of think about this in the context of capitalism. In capitalism, values are much more coherent than other 
modes of production. And the reason for that is that is something we're going to talk about, the coercive laws of competition. Basically, if I'm a capitalist and I want to get into some industry, I'm not going to invent my own methods of production. What are you going to do? Well, you need to be competitive. And so what you have to do is you have to employ what the methods of production that everybody else is employing or do better, right? You're not going to, to, to use some outdated mode uh, to make the thing where you're going to go out of business. You have to use, you have to sit on the cutting edge. And so you can say in some sense that these are more than just statistics, right? If there are kind of within capitalism specifically, um, there are standard methods of production and there are kind of standard numbers associated with everything, right? There's a standard amount of oil that it takes to make a, 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 a computer monitor. And there's also, and by that exact same logic, there's, an exa there's a standard amount of labor that goes into the computer monitor that is in some sense more than just an average amount of labor. It's something that says something about the technological state of society. Um, so these values are a lot more, they are averages, they're statistics in some sense, but they're also very real, especially in capitalism in some sense too. They're, 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 they're statistics, but they're, they're kind of more than that as well. They're kind of, const, they're kind of like a, a, a kind of coefficients of, of technology, uh, you could say. And that's what I mean by the 15 minutes. Hopefully that makes sense. That might have been kind of confusing. Um, secondly, I've already said this, but it bears repeating. Prices will fluctuate according to the supply and demand. According to supply and demand, but they'll be fluctuating around their values. So if demand and if demand is high and supply is low, the price will be higher than the value. And if supply is higher than demand, then it will be lower. Values again, it should be emphasized are equilibrium prices. There's a lot of vulgar criticism of the labor theory of value, saying, "Well, we ignore supply and demand." No, we don't. We just think that that is besides the point. We're, 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 we're just kind of uh, uh, focusing on something else about it. What if supply and demand are in equilibrium? We're focusing on that. Um, third, uh, we should talk about the, 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 the idea of socially, social necessity. I've already sort of talked about it um, uh, You know, in terms of, there's kind of two ways to think about social necessity in my opinion. One is the way I've already talked about, right? When I talk about socially necessary labor time, I'm saying like, what are those standard methods of production in society, right? The time, the time and resource use determined by that. Um, but in order to kind of even get to that point, we also have to talk about um, what does it take for a commodity to even kind of plug itself into the industry that way, right? So, um, so you know, my answer would you know would be that a commodity becomes socially necessary uh, when it's enough of a staple of society that it's kind of produced every day for mass consumption in, in predictable amounts. Uh, when it's kind of a staple of production in society. It's only those com those products that we kind of view as commodities to which the labor theory of value uh, applies. And an example I have of this is like, you know, when Atari and Nintendo started making video games, they, they kind of charged prices all over the place. The, 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 the labor theory of value, I don't think, should be assumed to apply to video games at the beginning of their, their creation because they're not really an industry yet. They're kind of just kind of a weird thing that people are making. It's only after video games become an industry that they become socially necessary. That's one kind of critical component of what social necessity means. Social necessity doesn't mean just like what we need to survive. It's what society determines as necessary to be making every day. And in that sense, the video game industry is very much a socially necessary industry um, uh, in the sense that it kind of is plugged in to the system. It's only at that point, I think, that you can expect the labor theory of value to apply, that you can expect prices to stabilize in some way and orbit their values according to supply and demand. Um, and then this last point, are we really talking about averages? This is the point I already made, but maybe I should make it again. In you know, capitalism specifically, there are always standard methods of production, which most, if not all capitalists, seek to emulate. So they're averages, but they're also kind of more than averages because they're in some sense, another sense, stable and constant. Not really constant, they're gonna be changing, right? People are gonna be innovating and we'll talk about that. But constant, at, uh, constant in the sense that, that if I go from one, in, one, one capitalist to another, they're gonna be kind of the same numbers. Um, this is true also for all commodities except for one. There's one exception to this rule about there being like a standard method of production. And that commodity is labor power. So let's talk about labor power. So most people think about capitalism as they go and they find a job. They don't necessarily see themselves as selling a product, but they are. They are selling a commodity. They're selling the only commodity that they have to sell, which is their own labor. And that is a commodity, and that's what I'm calling labor power. Labor power is the commodity that is a day's work from a worker. 
And when I talk about a day's work from a worker, I'm talking about like the day's work from like an average worker with average skills. Um, there are versions you can, we can improve the labor theory of value later by adding on conditions to make it, to talk about like different, different uh, types of skills, skilled labor. Uh, there's ways to do that. Um, but for simplicity, we're just going to assume that workers uh, kind of have a, have like a homogenous set of skills and, he, and we have like an average worker and that's all that's available on the market for the capitalist to buy. Let's just, let's just say that. That'll simplify the, the discussion of labor power as a single commodity as opposed to a, 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 an array of commodities, which is what it is in real life. But let's just assume it's a single commodity because that'll keep things simple. Um, and, and, and what I do mean as the commodity labor power is I really am work, look, referring to a day's work. Now, it, now, how many hours are in a day is kind of determined by society. We're gonna, and it, and it tends to be a societal constant, right? The whole, the whole country decides on like an eight-hour workday or a ten-hour workday or whatever. Although, you know, obviously, you know, that tends to change more fluidly. But, but let's just assume again for simplicity that that there is a that there is a common amount of the day's work. There's like a, a fixed. Let, Let's assume that there's a fixed number of hours that, that, that people work every day, right? There is a daily uh, a number of hours that a day's work corresponds to. And that's what the capitalist has to buy. Now, of course, again, in real life, capitalists buy, you know, contract workers for like a year or sometimes for, you know, pay them by the week or whatever. We're going to assume that this is a daily thing. Every day, the worker goes back into the market and sells their labor again. And again, that's just kind of a simplification for simplicity's sake. It's not really a, a weakness of the model so much, I don't think. Um, so that's what I mean by labor power as a commodity, a day's work that you purchase from a worker on the market. And now we need to ask a very interesting question, which is what is the labor power, labor value of that? What is the value of that? What is the day's wage? Um, cause that's really what the value of labor power is. It's going to correspond to the daily wage. And so the answer is like any other commodity, the total labor time you know the, the the value of labor power is the total labor time required to produce it it's it's the it's it's how much work how much how many hours of work are needed each day to produce that worker on the market and so if i'm a worker what this means is that so think about it this way there's a bundle of commodities that the worker consumes each day uh every day uh you need food you need a certain amount of shelter um you need you need clothing uh, and so forth. And there's, so there's a bundle of commodities you can think of that the worker needs in order to exist every day, to continue to exist one more day. And we're going to call that the means of subsistence. That's an important word to remember. The means of subsistence is the bundle of commodities necessary to reproduce the worker to sell his own labor power each day. Um, and and it, it's a more complicated bundle than just the immediate goods that we need because we want to produce we, we, we need to talk about all of the costs of production of the worker. The worker has a certain fitness level, right? The worker has, has a, muscle, a certain level of muscle atrophy. The, certain, the worker has a certain educational level. The, certain, the worker has to be able to reproduce other workers too, and that has to go into the cost too, right? The worker has to be able to uh, support a family to have, uh, to have worker kids to send to work. Otherwise, you're gonna run out of workers eventually. Remember, the mode of production has to reproduce itself, so the worker has to reproduce. Capitalism is very bad at this, but let's assume it's good at this. Let's give it the benefit of the doubt. Um, and in that case, you need to not only uh, kind of factor in the daily wage for the worker himself, but you also need to factor in a wage to support the family, to, um, to send the kids to school, to educate them, uh, to deliver a pregnancy. There's a very complicated bundle of commodities here. If the worker is expected to get sick, like let's say 10 times throughout, his, throughout their life, then there's a certain amount of average costs associated with that sickness. And so the daily wage has to include whatever portion of that cost will pay itself off over the course of their life. So if the worker works like an average uh, of 12,000 days in their life, and they, there's like a, a six hour, you know, pregnancy that, you know, six hours of work needs to be done to deliver that worker's uh, one or two kids at some point, then, then you know, uh, uh, six over one, six over 12,000 needs, uh, you know, needs to be added to the labor value of labor power every day. Um, uh, if, if, if the worker needs to live in a home that has to be built, that's going to take, uh, you know, 200 hours total to build, um, and, and they can live in that one house their whole life, then you've got to take that 200 hours and divide it by 12,000 to get that amount. And that, that factors into the means of subsistence as well. So this bundle of commodities could include partial products, 
but but we can still think of it as basically there is a bundle of commodities that the worker consumes every single day that they need to consume to survive. And that bundle of commodities has a value, and that value is the value of labor power. The value of labor power is the value of the means of subsistence. And the means of subsistence is the bundle of commodities that are necessary for the worker to, to consume in order to have what they need to show themselves up on the market the next day and, and have a unit of labor power to offer to the capitalist. Now that's an interesting way to think about this stuff, but it's, it's also a very powerful way to think about this stuff, and it's also the correct way to think about this stuff in the context of the labor theory of value. It's the only way to do it. This is the only way to think about it. Um, but already we can see that labor power as a commodity is a very special commodity, and we're only going to see that more clearly as we go. So now we finally have finished creating sort of a way to decipher all these numbers. We now have a theory of prices, and we wanted one that we wanted such a thing that empowered labor. Remember, we mentioned that that was sort of a, a political goal to, to some extent, and um, we sort of justified that in, in more natural ways as we went. We kind of found reasons why it's kind of more than a political goal, but the only thing to pick. But 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 beyond that, I think that you can say that we've done that in the se in in the following sense, which is that. You know, it's you could argue that a labor theory of value doesn't that there is no labor theory of value that empowers labor in the sense that the laborer is still doesn't have much control over what they're doing or, um, you know, how they're doing it. Right. There are standard methods of production. The worker sort of has to do things a certain way. So it's not like they control prices very much. But what this does, what, what having a labor theory of value does and, and being able to talk about economics and the system that you're in in terms of the lab, a labor theory of value is you've now centralized the discussion around labor. The conversation is no longer about goods and commodities flying around. The conversation is about you and me. The conversation is about the labor, the work being done by society. And I think that's super important, not even just for a political reason to empower labor, but we have very much like, uh, with the labor theory of value, you can very much humanize your economics a little bit. Economics has, in some sense, you know, with, with the kind of neoliberal way to think about things been flipped on its head. Again, to kind of remind you, you, you tend to think about the economy as like a bunch of goods flying around with numbers attached. But, w but with a labor theory of value, we've at least taken a step towards getting away from that. And we've, we've taken a step towards thinking about uh, our system in terms of people working, right? It, the, the conversation is now about the people doing the work and producing the stuff. It's no longer about the goods, it's about the labor. And I think that's very important. Now, I think that's probably a good place to stop um, the discussion of the labor theory of value. In the next video, we're going to start to kind of put, aggregate stuff together and talk about like societal dynamics. In particular, we're going to talk about the falling rate of profit. But in order to kind of preview that, um, what I'm going to start to think about, we can, we, 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 we've been thinking about labor power as like a unit of labor power, like a single person selling their labor. But we can think about it kind of on a more societal level too. We can say like in aggregate, the labor value of the entire working population as a whole. We can talk about that too. The whole we have this whole working population. You know, maybe maybe you know, uh, two hundred million people, right? Maybe that's your working population, and that whole total working population consumes an aggregate means of subsistence. There's a giant bundle of commodities that the working population has to consume each day, and so a portion of every single day, maybe like the first five hours or something, has to be spent creating that bundle before anybody can like begin to think about, I don't know, profiting. That's kind of a necessary cost of reproduction for the capitalist system. And so we're gonna start to ha kind of think in terms of like amounts of time that the whole society has to work in order to kind of roll over to the next day. That's kind of where we're going with this. But in the meantime, I think that's probably a good place to stop. So in the next video, we'll talk about the falling rate of profit.